Hey everyone, Andrew here, doing quite ordinary today actually. I'm going to put up a little video for you talking about sawmill blade tension. As it turns out, I am down in Georgia, someplace at a secret location on the second story of a three-story bunker and uh, have had a long day of meetings and so on. Uh, so we got to do something different, which is going to include some video editing. I'm going to try and slap this video together for you. I've taken some good clips of how I measure blade tension. And then we're going to talk a little bit about creating a calibration curve to correlate between the method of setting blade tension and actual tension on the mill. So without further babbling, let's get right into the meat of the video. Okay, so here's the device that I created to measure tension on the mill and as you can see it's basically a digital caliper and it's been extended so I can get a measurement over a greater distance and this just kind of you know increases the resolution of the measurement I have another video that talks about why I do this and it's kind of similar to this one you can go watch it anyway here I'm gonna measure the distance and I end up with 24 inches from one end to the other. So then to start with, I will sort of set a zero point for blade tension. And I just kind of give it a little wiggle, and then we're going to bring it up to where it's barely touching the uh, uh, blade guides and re-zero out my veneer caliper. Now we're starting out at zero on my pressure gauge. In my case, I'm using hydraulic cylinders hooked to a hand pump to tension the mill. My zero isn't exactly zero, but everything is relative, and I'm not really worried about the fact that the gauge starts off at maybe 40 PSI or so. Not really a big issue. might actually be a bigger issue if it was pegged down at the bottom and zero, and I didn't know really where it was at. So here I go. I'm going to close the valve on my hand pump and then slowly start bringing up the tension. Now, the initial tension that I bring it up to is only going to be 200 psi in my case. I mean, this would be different for everybody's mill depending on how yours is set up, and a lot of people aren't even going to have this method at all. It's going to be entirely different doesn't matter. Um, I'm just going to bring it up to a very low tension setting of 200 and then once I get it up there we'll uh, take the camera down and get a reading and the reading is 0 .001 0 .001 uh, over 24 inches. So here we just go again. We'll keep going through this up to uh, 400 psi. We got a reading of 0 0.006. On we we'll go again from 400 to 600 psi. And then we'll get a reading of 0 0.013. And again, we're going to go up, taking it up to 800 psi. Okay, there we go, guide 800 and a reading of 0 0.0185, 0 0.0190, somewhere in there, and then finally up to 1,000 PSI. So I've kind of gone beyond where I would really run the mill, but I think you want to span from below where you would run to above where you would run in this exercise and that was 0 0.024 anyway here is my final numbers kind of hand scratched on a sheet of paper and then let's talk about this a little bit okay so i have put some parameters into an excel spreadsheet here and then also put uh, the results of the readings that i took uh, when measuring blade tension so first of all, let's just talk about these parameters on the top here. 
blade width, 1.35 inches. That 1.35 is from the back side of the blade to the bottom of the gullet. Keep in mind that the tooth really does not count for anything in terms of how it's going to affect uh, this tension calculation. All right, yeah, I know if we really got into the weeds on this, there would be some effect from the tooth, but we're not going to get that far into the weeds in all this uh, theoretical stuff. We are uh, sawmill men and women, not physics professors here. Um, so, back of the blade to the bottom of the gullet. The actual width of this blade was 1.5 inches. So, you can see I've got 1.35, which is somewhat less than that. Blade thickness, 0 0.042, or whatever your blade happens to be. Um, you know, it's probably going to be pretty close to whatever the manufacturer says it is. Uh, modulus of elasticity, um, 29 million PSI is generally an accepted number. And so we're going to go with that. Unless you have a really gigantic, monstrous tensile testing machine where you can make this measurement and verify it, uh, we're just going to have to believe someone's published data. And this is kind of where, you know, we're going to be eventually doing estimating based on this assumption. Now we have the starting point or the starting distance that we uh, set our calipers at, which was 24 inches, and you saw that measured a couple minutes ago, um, closer to the start of this video. Um, all right, so in red here, I have pressure settings, which in my case is the pressure that I am uh, pumping into my hydraulic cylinders to tension the mill. In your case, it may be different things. It may be some uh, reading on a spring, it may be a torque wrench reading, it may be so many turns on a crank handle, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what it is, but you're going to put those values here. You know, it might be one, two, three, four, five, six turns on the handle, it might be whatever, tension on the spring, torque wrench setting. Like I say, it doesn't matter. You're going to put however you do it in this column here. And then we have our caliper readings. Now, I just did this twice, and I've done this some other, a few other times as well, but for this, this exercise, I just did it twice, and then I took an average, and so I averaged those readings. Um, and why I do this more than once is just, you just want to make sure that it's consistent. You can see here that at the 800 PSI mark, uh, I got a little bit of a variation between readings, you know, 19 thousandths versus 15 thousandths. And I'm sure if I did this a third and a fourth time, I'd probably find that one of these was more accurate than the other reading. But for purposes of this exercise, we just averaged them together. All right, so now I come over here and I start calculating. First, I'm going to calculate in this column the percent strain. And in reality, this is really as far as you need to go. Everybody talks about this in terms of PSI, but it's going from this percent strain to PSI uh, is, is just a, a exercise in, in calculation. I mean, we could say uh, that your blade should be at a certain percent strain and that would be a good enough value because we have to make some inferences and assumptions to get to this PSI value anyway. Uh, so the calculation uh, for percent strain is simply the caliper reading, in my case the average caliper reading here divided by the initial starting point of 24 inches. So 0.101 is equal to, let me double click on that, you can see what the cells are. Okay, E13, which is this cell right here, 
0.02425 divided by the 24 inches. All right, finally, we get to the holy grail over here, which is our stress calculation. And again, so far, all this portion, portion we've been able to sort of directly measure and calculate. Uh, here we have to estimate based on some assumptions like this modulus of elasticity, for example. So here, this is simply going to be the strain times the modulus of elasticity. So let me double click on one of these here and you can see the formula uh, E10, which is this value right here divided by the starting inches. So that's going to give you your strain times D3, which is your modulus of elasticity. And that's going to give you your PSI. So now we have a correlation between however it is that we tension our mill and our blade tension. And we'll do one final exercise, which is to graph um, graph that relationship. And so I've done that here. Uh, I've graphed the relationship between my cylinder pressure and my blade tension here. Created this graph, done a uh, linear fit, which you can do in Excel. Many of you may not, may or may not be familiar with how to do you know any of this in Excel, but it doesn't really matter. You can do this on a sheet of paper as well in terms of you know just the data here. That's perfectly fine. Um, since I have a Excel or some kind of a spreadsheet. I'm just going to do that on the spreadsheet here to show it. And then I created a uh, linear fit that shows a formula relationship uh, between my uh, method of tensioning and blade PSI, or uh, yeah, blade PSI, um, which that formula is given here. So I could put that in my calculator and uh, whatever cylinder pressure I happen to have, it should correlate very well with my blade tension. Anyway, I think this is an extremely valuable exercise to, uh, to do, and one that you should do periodically, just because you don't know on your mill if certain things have changed. For example, if uh, you're tensioning your mill and uh, you're turning a uh, some kind of a threaded rod or whatever to tension your mill, it starts out being very well lubricated and then all of a sudden it's not well lubricated. That's going to make a difference in how this reading correlates to your percent strain and your PSI or uh, you know maybe something something else changes. If you're using a torque wrench and uh, you know your torque wrench gets a little bit off or whatever, it could be off. Or if you change blade thicknesses and all of a sudden you're running a different thickness blade, you should go back and do this measurement again. Um, some of the uh, mills that are out there, I think they're very crude in how and how they apply tension and, and it's kind of a by guess and by golly thing in, in terms of how you arrive at actual numbers and I think it's extremely valuable to see where you are in terms of this number at least you get a, a good estimate and a good correlation this way. Now one final parting shot is that I think you uh, will want to go back and look at uh, one of my older videos that talks also about blade tension and I go a little bit more into the idea of you know why it can be beneficial to have uh, a blade with a smaller cross-sectional area in certain cases if you're having trouble with your mill um, actually being able to apply enough load to tension the blade properly and I found that with my mill that uh, a smaller cross-sectional area on the blade was beneficial at that time. 
see in a future video here, hopefully that I'll get done relatively shortly, I'm going to talk uh, more about why uh, rubber tire mills, and, and when I'm talking about rubber tires, I mean um, like car tires, trailer tires, that type of thing. Uh, why those mills are really very limited in terms of what kind of tension you can apply to the mill. And so I want to have a little discussion about that as well. So that's an upcoming video to look for after this one. Again, uh, as always, thank you so much for watching and uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Thanks again.